As we uh, are talking today, we're talking about the cremators. We're going to discuss how you set them up, a initial startup, whether it be a gas burner or whether it be an oil burner. Uh, some of the discussion we'll have will be talk about the size of the capacities. Uh, we'll do some troubleshooting on the different burners. And any questions you may have, there's a comment box at the lower portion of your, of your computer, your screen. Go ahead, type them in, and we'll discuss the comments and, and questions at the end of the session. Um, that way we can cover everything, and then the questions may be review of, of something that we discussed or something that we can bring up if necessary. Um, so as we start, again, my name is Doug Berkey. I've been with Valco for 23 years. I've uh, worked in the tooling department. I've been through engineering, worked with tech support. And currently, I'm a product engineer with the heating products, nesting products, and uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today. As you see, we got we have a standard cremator here, and we're going to discuss the different items and how you set it up and and, and move forward with it. And if you can see right here, we have a gas burner set on this unit right now, and we will discuss the gas burner and the oil burners. And we have this plugged in right now. As the units are shipped, the burners are in a carton that are inside the, inside the cremators themselves. So when you remove the, when you open up the cremator, you take the burner out, it will mount on four thread studs that are on the unit itself. We have four mounted thread studs that you mount the, no matter what burner it is, to the units themselves. They will each burner will also come with a temp probe or a heat probe, and it has a fitting on it so you can secure it to the cremator. There's also an o ring, this is only for shipping purposes, it helps keep this uh, fitting with the, with the temp probe. When you install these, you must remove this o ring, do not install it with that o ring. So, remove that o ring, you can place the temp probe in the port of the of the cremator itself. Thread on there, let me get my wrench here. You would thread the fitting into the port. Now we'll raise this up here, we'll open up the unit. And you want to set the temp probe two to three inches inside the cremator. So then you can go ahead, once you get that set, you can go ahead and tighten your fitting. That'll hold that temp probe in there accordingly. All right. And this, again, this is with any burner, whether it be a gas burner or an oil burner. Each burner, it does come with a connection cable that hooks up to that heat probe. You simply plug that in. There we go. It does go on a certain way. There is a positive and a negative. So we have that set up there. And as you see, again, we have a gas burner here. We have a gas line connection. As we go right through here, we have it hooked up to the main, the main regulator. And when you do set these up, again, with any gas component, you want to make sure that when you connect, do any gas connections, you do a, a weak test. And normally what that is, you just have a soapy water solution. You need to spray that. I'll turn the gas on. You can spray that on your connections. And what will happen is if you have any leaks, you will get some bubbling. With the, That's what the soapy solution does. So as you can see, we do not have that. So we're, we have a good connection right there. And that is, that is very important when you do that. Any gas... A, uh, appliance of any sort, always do a leak test because if you get any gas leaking, eventually you could have some serious issues later on with combustions. So as we go through here, again, we have the gas burner and when these are shipped to you, there is a main gas port adjustment screw behind this cap. And what you do it's, you have to set that determining 
based on determine what pre-meter you have. You have to adjust this. No matter what unit you have, you have to adjust this. Because when these units are shipped, this screw in there, it determines the gas, the amount of gas flow, the amount of BTUs going. And they are shipped with the screw screwed out a certain distance, a number of six screw and uh, six turns. And that is for priming the unit. That is for allowing the proper gas to get through there just for its uh, setup procedure. Once you ignite it first, which we have done on this before, um, you can do not, do not operate this unit with that screw adjustment as it's shipped to you. You must make an adjustment to it. And to know what that adjustment is, every cremator is, you, there'll be different sizes. And in the manuals, we have a chart of the amount of BTUs for each model. You can see the different models here. And every model has a different BTU rating. And you determine what rating you have. We have a model 4830 here, and I'll discuss the sizing in a little bit. So we need 185,000 BTU for this model. In this manual, on the next page, we have a chart, a gas pressure, two different charts, one for um, natural gas and one for propane. And this tells you how many turns you need to do for that input adjustment. Right now we have a unit that's running off of natural gas. So we need 185,000 BTU. So we find that location, we come up, we determine how many turns we need to do based on input pressures. And when you have the input pressure, what you're doing is you're gonna run at, since we're at natural, we're gonna run at uh, three and a half is what the setting is. And again, this is in the manual. There's other inputs in here. Your three and a half input will come through. So we wanna run down to this. Actually, I think we're at four. I'm sorry, I said three and a half, we're at four. So I want to follow that down. When I see that four, I want to go, looks to be about one and a half turns. So I'm going to take a screwdriver. And what you need to do is after you have that adjustment known, you fully close the screw. You turn it clockwise completely. Now you want to count how many turns you want to go backwards counterclockwise to set your, your setting. So I wanted one and a half. So there's one. I have one and a half settings. Once you have that applied, you can go ahead and close that back up. Now you should be set for the proper size, the proper BTU rating for this particular model. Again, you must do that with all cremators, all gas cremators, whether it be natural gas or propane. That must be adjusted before you do regular operation. Once you have everything set up there, we have things going here, and you want to plug in your unit. And as we plug that in, it may be a little bit difficult to see right here, we can kind of show a little bit on this. This is your control, electronic control. And there's different uh, displays here. And we have a start, a step button, step one, step two. And you need to press those to get your programming set up for this. We're gonna show on this one. So we have this unit. So first thing you wanna do is you hit your step button first. You see it says burn easy. Hit it another time. And now it's coming up, it says, it should be say set, and this is your time. When you're setting your programming time, your burn time, you wanna set your time period up for one hour per 100 pounds of media that you're going to, you're going to cremate, plus 30 minutes extra to make sure that you're getting everything out of that. So depending on the capacity of the unit, what you're, or what you're actually loading into at times, you want to set that up. So say we want to put in 200 pounds. You set it for two hours, but you want that additional 30 minutes on there. So you use your up and down buttons to set that. 
Once that is set, you should be able to hit your start. It'll start up. And it shows the temperature and your timing right there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop it for right now. We have things set up where we can adjust things accordingly. And we're showing the temperature, what the temp says inside there. And once things operate, you'll see that temperature rise and you see your timing go down. So that's counting backwards. If this unit, if the temperature does not rise 10 degrees within the first minute, it will shut off. It says something is not operating properly. And we'll get to the troubleshooting here in a moment. So as that is getting set up, as you're running those, that will tell you that's a very easy setup system. Again, you want to make sure you have your proper time period set up for, again, 100 pounds is set for one hour. For every 100 pounds you set up, you set up for an hour each and add 30 minutes. So as the unit starts up, you see the flames inside, you get going, and you can see you can get everything set accordingly. When you do start things up and you start firing, what you also need to verify is you have the proper air mixture in these as well. And right now we have what they call air bands. They have little wing nuts on here. These are your air bands that you adjust how much air is coming in, okay? And what you're doing on a gas burner, you want the maximum amount of air with no black smoke coming out of your exhaust. You can see on right here, this decal and this adjustment, you have less air if you rotate this up and you have more air if you bring this down. So you always want these set up for the maximum amount of air, tighten those down with no black smoke coming out of the stack. And that'll give you your proper efficient burn rate. As we go through these, well, you got everything burning, you made everything's operating. now. We'll start to go into troubleshooting of these types of systems right here, the gas burners. Gas burners, the most common maintenance issue you may have is the igniter tips. And what we're saying there is we have the igniter tips, you have your igniters, this is your assembly, and this is where the fuel mixture is coming out. You have your spark electrodes, igniters, and with gas burners, you will get carbon buildup on the tips of these igniters. When you do get that carbon buildup, it, it starts to prevent that, that spark from jumping properly, jumping to the ground plate like it needs to to get a proper spark, proper ignition. When you do get that carbon buildup in wet climates, moisture climates you know, in the spring days where you're getting a lot of dew in the mornings, if that carbon buildup gets wet, it will prevent that spark from jumping. And that is the highest maintenance issue with gas burners. You need to make sure those tips are clean and dry. Um, again, that is the most common issue that you will have with gas burners. If you keep those clean and dry, you may have to periodically take an emery cloth, clean those up a little bit, and you're, and you're fine as long as everything's clean and dry. Sometimes even if they may just be a little wet more than they are or, or, or soot it up, keep them dry, and that spark will work for you. Another thing to verify when you have uh, spark issues is to make sure you have your ignition, your spark gap set properly. You need to have an eighth of an inch to 532nd inch between this igniter and this ground plate between this igniter and the ground plate. Remember, an eighth of an inch to five thirty seconds of an inch. If that is, if those are rotated out of place and you got too much of a gap, that spark will not jump across and it will not create your ignition. You have other things to look for where you have cracks in the igniters themselves. If there are cracks in these housings, moisture can get, can get into it and prevent it from operating properly as well. If you are getting spark, but you're not getting any ignition, you're not getting any combustion, you may have a, a fuel problem. And with that, you want to verify that your fuel supply is flowing properly, you have a proper supply. Um, do you want to verify you know, if you're using propane, your tank is full, you're not, you have the proper size 
plumbing going to your tank or to your cremator. And if there, if the, all that is proper, maybe you're not getting the right pressure going through the cremator itself. And what you can do on the gas burners, we have your main input regulator for natural gas. You want to have five to five and a half inches coming out, or I'm sorry, coming into the regulator. If you're running propane, you want 11 inches coming into the regulator. And you need to check that at your main regulator coming from your fuel supply. When you are coming out of this regulator, there is also a secondary or pilot regulator as well. And there is a pressure tap on the main regulator right on the side. You want to check, put your manometer on there and make sure that you have four inches coming out of this pressure tap. When the unit, when you're trying to operate, you must do all this while you're operating as you start it, try to do the ignition and verify that gas pressure as it's trying to run. Again, four inches of water column coming out of here. When it gets to the secondary or the pilot regulator, you wanna verify that there's three and a half inches coming out of this. You can remove this plug right here and connect your manometer to it. And again, you must have three and a half inches of water column coming out and here we again we go back to that setup we have that adjuster on this regulator the secondary pilot regulator to adjust this you can remove the cap that's on there and you can adjust this accordingly and again you can verify all that right here if you are still having ignition issues you verify that your pressures are correct you have four inches coming to this regulator. You have three and a half coming out. You're still not getting the proper fuel mixture, no combustion. Very well possibly there may be a small particle of dirt or something inside what they call this T-block. It's your orifice assembly, it's your pilot orifice assembly. I have run into that before. And what you can do is again, you take this unit off, you would disconnect your ignition cables. There's two screws as you see right here two screws that hold that to the housing, loosen those up. You must loosen your gas connection right there and you take it off and then here's your, here's your igniter assembly. As I flip it over, you can see there's an opening right here. And what I found at times, just do a light, very lightly tap on something. There may be just a particle of dirt or something inside there. See if it'll come loose and fall out. You want to make sure that Everything in there is clean. Again, it's a small orifice assembly in there. So if there's any dirt, it will plug that up. That is, a, and that will probably go through all of your gas connections. That will take care of anything that we've covered right here for gas supply, whether it be pressure, whether you have the right plumbing going to your unit or whether there's um, plugs, dirt or anything plugging up in the pilot orifice T-block assembly. As we go through, talk a little bit more on the gas cremator. There is also, when you start up, if the blower starts to run, but then it stops, if the blower is not running, you will not get any, get any ignition. So if the blower actually stops right away within six seconds, chances are you may have an air proving, an air vacuum problem. And there is an air proving switch on the gas burner and what that does, it has a tube that flows into the fan housing itself. We'll come around and show that here. See this air tube right here coming out of the air proving switch. And that goes into the fan housing is what it does. And that's verifying that there's pressure coming from the fan blower, the blower. It's triggering that switch and that triggers inside the ignition component to let it know there is air pressure. If the blower stops running, chances are this pressure switch, this air proving switch was not reading the proper pressure and it did not trigger. So it's a safety precaution. So you want to verify that there is nothing inside this gas, this, I'm sorry, this uh, air tube. So you may need to loosen it up. There are nuts on it. There's fittings on it. Loosen that up. You can take it out. It comes out of this housing, blow through it and verify that there's nothing, it's nice and clean. If there's anything else inside there, you know, spider webs, dirt, I've, I've encountered where there has been water inside those. Anything, any obstruction in there will prevent that 
from operating properly and that will shut the blower down. More troubleshooting with the gas burners. If there are issues where you've gone through this general maintenance in what we've just described with the troubleshooting on this gas burner, if there's more issues where you have not found those general ones, every gas burner does come with the manufacturer manual as well. And in the back of the troubleshooting section of that manual, they have the step-by-step -step procedure of what to do to, to make sure everything is checked accordingly. You must follow that step by step. If you look over some of these steps, you may not find the right correction to your issue. This is a 24 volt system. After you plug it, it's normally 120 or 230 going in. Well, once they run through transformers, they're a 24 volt system. So many things you will need to check are 24 volt between many connections. So truly go step by step go through this and you will find the issue if you have not if you were not successful in finding the issue by doing general inspections that is what we have right now for gas burner setup and troubleshooting and as we uh, discuss a little bit more we're going to change this burner out we're going to have someone change this burner out and put on a put on a diesel burner oil burner and as he's doing that, we're going to discuss a little bit more on the cremators themselves, how to size, you know, determine the size, the capacity, and everything with them. Yeah. All right, thank you. And as I said earlier, this model right here, we have a 4830. And when we're talking mo different models and different sizes of cremators, that 4830 is, is significant. That number, yeah, the first set of numbers tells you the length of the unit. The second set of numbers discusses the diameter, the size of it. So with the 4830, we have a 48 inch long unit with a 30 inch diameter. We have varying models. We have 84, 36, we have 72, 30s, 96, 42, we, and we go up to 106, 52, which is 106 inches long, 52 inches in diameter. We also have secondary burners or afterburners, what they call model 12, which is 12 inches in diameter, or model 20, which is 20 inches in diameter. I always recommend a model 20. It's the most efficient afterburner. It does what it does. It does the best application. It has been verified years ago with EPA testing that it is the best to use. And when you're buying cremators, we sell those, we sell the stack separately. So when you order those, you order the cremator, you order the stack separately, or your secondary burner. The minimum length stack that you need is three foot, 36 inches. You can get longer if you need to, but do not go shorter than three foot. If you are putting on an afterburner or a secondary burner, you do not need to order a stack. The afterburner comes with a minimum stack under it. Uh, you bolt directly through the main cremator, and it is set high enough it has the proper distance necessary, and it has its own exhaust stack on it already built into it. Again, when I recommend a secondary burner, the Model 20, any afterburner or secondary burner is going to be set up perpendicular to the main unit. So it's going to be set 90 degrees. The Model 20 units are large enough, they hang out enough that you actually have a support rod, you must have that. Have that adjusted where that's set properly according to what it says in the manual. If you do not have that support rod, your secondary burner may hang low and cause issues. You want to make sure you put that support rod in there properly. And when we start talking about units and when I discuss the sizes of them, we open up this model here, we have inside. You can put, when you start to load these units, when you do load them, they're set up where you put your capacity up, you load them up roughly three quarters full. Typically that's about where these angle irons are. You always want an open gap up here. That allows a good air mixture with your fuel mixture and flames so things circulate properly and burn efficiently. Also, when you do load these, you do not want any media, anything within 12 inches of the burner itself. Anything closer than that, 
will block your fuel, will block your flames, it will not burn properly. In fact, it may not burn at all. It may shut itself off because it does not have the proper flow through it. So you must make sure you, everything is at least 12 inches away from that burner. And, and you want that gap up here. So basically three quarter full. You can add great kits with these as well. They're heavy welded units that sit at the bottom of the models and so of each cremator unit. And what that does is it raises the media or whatever item you're burning off of that bottom floor and allows air mixture again to go under that, the flame and the air, just like you want on top. It gives a better burn. It's a lot more efficient. It will shorten your capacity, lengthen your, or shorten your capacity a little bit. So if you do add those, remember if you have a 300 pound unit, you may not be putting in 300 pounds if you're using the great kits. I do recommend the great kits because they do help it burn so much more efficiently. So again, remember, you load that three-quarter full and keep it 12 inches away from the burner itself. When the units are shipped with you, there is shipped to you, there is a separate piece of insulation shipped with them. It is inside this unit. And what that is for is you must use that. There's a little section right next to the stack, right here on the inside that you want to use this insulation to fill in with. During shipping pur purposes, they don't put the, they don't install this because it may drop out during shipping, so they just let it lay in there. You must fill in that gap, that open area underneath this shell, right here on the end. Use utilize that secondary piece of insulation to fill that gap in. Clean outdoors on all models, ash doors and clean outdoors. You can swing those open. And whether you use a makeshift hoe or a special tool or anything, you want to clean those ashes out. Um, that helps, again, helps everything burn efficiently for each pre following burn that you have. When you do burn the cremators, when you do operate them, you will have a once complete cycle. After it is done operating, you will still have some media inside the unit when you're finished should be roughly 20 to 25% of what you originally loaded into it should still be in there. Most people think we need to, that needs to burn all of it through the first cycle. Well, that is not correct. If once that, that little 20, 25% is still left in there, if you're trying to burn all of that through your first cycle, mostly what you're doing is heating up a large open area. Since there's so much less down at the bottom, all you're doing is heating up a large area. You're not really burning that com those components. So you always have 20 to 25% left over from one cycle. You leave it in there, remove all your ash, but leave the, the larger material in there for the next program cycle. When you are ready to burn the next cycle, you do your loading in there, get your, your media back in it, and leave that 20, 25% in there. That will burn off in the next cycle. After that was done, again, we'll have another 20 to 25% left over. That 20% is left over for the next burn cycle. That's what makes it efficient. Mike, thank you, Mike. Mike has installed a oil burner on here now. He's removed that uh, gas burner. We put an oil burner on now. As you can see here, we have it set up. Got the temp probe still in there and everything. We're using the same control box as electronic control. And with oil burners, they're much they layer. Um, there's not as much maintenance with these burners. It's set up to still the same programming on here. One hour for every 100 pounds and you want to plus your, your 30 minutes. When you're operating oil burners, what we have set up here is a bypass setup with the, with the fuel supply. And what that means what that means is we have one sis we have one plumbing system hooked up and there is your input right here and since this is a bypass system any excess fuel is going to be bypassed going away and it's going to continue to recirculate in the pump and get reused inside here if you're doing a non-bypass system which i recommend um, because it's a little bit more efficient is it allows the pressure to kind of come through a lot easier 
you'll have a two pipe system and this is all shown in the manual you will have your main supply come in on this port here there is a port down underneath the pump it's very difficult to, to get to right here you remove that port plug and there's a there's a secondary little set screw that you would put inside there and then you put your your plumbing fittings inside there what that does that's what they call non bypass any excess fuel that's in the pump will come back out of that and go recirculate back into your supply tank your fuel tank i recommend that because it relieves the pressure it's it's easier on the pump the pump does not have to work as hard trying to recirculate everything and it allows things to go back into your main tank and you must have a filter on your tank so when it's going back through it's actually refiltering itself when it comes back to the burner again so again it, it allows the pressure on the pump to operate a little bit better and you're refiltering that fuel your plumbing supply from your fuel tank you want to supply your line from the bottom of the fuel tank and your return goes in the top of the fuel tank when you first set these up, the pump is already primed. When it's shipped to you, the pump is already primed. If you have issues that you need to verify if there's fuel, if the pump is not working properly, or you think you may have run fuel out of you, do not, do not run these fuel dry, these fuel pumps empty. You do not want them dry. That will it will destroy the pump itself. It must you must have fuel in it all the time. If you want to verify that, there is a prime port right here, just like a brake line on a vehicle. You loosen that up, you start the system, and you get fuel coming through, and that helps prime it. But again, they are always primed when they come through. So you see there's oil in it. It's already leaking. So we have that working fine. Once you start these up, again, there's not a whole lot to them. You can fire them up. You start your program. You start your control. It will fire up and operate very well. You do not need to adjust the fuel supply on it. Um, that is determined by a nozzle on the unit that's shipped with the cremators. When, if you're going into any troubleshooting on these, again, there's not a lot to them. They're very uh, robust units. Most times, you're either not going to have the, the fuel supply and if that is the case, you want to verify everything is operating with your fuel line. So as you go through, one of the first things you want to check is, is the fuel supply. When this is, is trying to operate, you may need to come around that side, I believe. And there's, you have your pump, you have your fuel valve right here, your solenoid valve. So what you want to do is when you operate, you want to loosen this nut as it's trying to operate. When you loosen that, if fuel comes out, then you know your pump is operating properly. So again, you loosen this nut here, and if any fuel come out while it's trying to operate, then the fuel pump is working fine. So you can tighten that back down Then, as it's still trying to operate, then you loosen this fitting up here. And as is, again, as it's still trying to operate, if fuel does not come out of here, then you know that your solenoid valve has failed. If fuel does come out, then you know your pump is working fine, your, your solenoid valve is working properly. At that point, you may have you may have a blocked fuel line. You want to disconnect that, make sure it's cleaned out. Um, or the nozzle inside the gun assembly may be plugged up. You want to make sure your nozzle is cleaned off as well. There's, again, you want just your fuel train, make sure that everything is cleaned out. Normally, you're going to find out whether your pump or your solenoid valve is, is faulted if you do not have any fuel mixture going through. If you do not have spark, you have fuel spraying in there, but you're not getting any spark. Chances are you may have an issue with your spark ignition transformer. And that is 
That is set up that is right on top of the, the burr itself. You have a clamp that holds that in place. So you loosen that clamp up, loosen that bolt up, remove that clamp. This is your whole ignition, your spark transformer right here. And it has two springs coming off and they make contact with bus bars going to your igniters. If you do not have spark, the chances are you verify that you have proper voltage coming through or proper spark any way you want to from this transformer. They must, and you must make sure that the springs are making contact on these bus bars. If the transformer is outputting properly, the chances are you may have a spark electrode issue where again, maybe there is a, a cracked housing on the electrodes um, or just maybe a wire for the tips are not adjusted accordingly. Again, the tips will need to be an eighth inch from each other to make sure that the spark is jumping across from each other. With most oil burners, that is most anything you will run across. There may be maybe an issue with the controller. You may get a temp probe failure. The controller will tell you a temp probe failure, or this is the temp probe itself is not working properly. One way to verify that, whether it be a gas burner or an oil burner, is you can take a wire and make a jumper across these terminals. And if that probe error goes away, then you know your temp probe failed. And you can replace that. If that still doesn't work, but it's still telling you a probe fail, you can go inside the controller. You want to be careful, but to put a jumper across the two terminals on there, if it works, then you have a broken wire. If it doesn't work, chances are you need to replace your control board in your, in your controller. You may have a low voltage issue on any of these models. Again, as we say, it's a 24 volt system inside of it. You still need your 120 volt or your 230 volt supply going to it. If you have a low voltage, you will end up causing issues with this and it will not operate. And when you set the system up, you must have a 20 amp circuit breaker to supply your proper voltage to these units. And do, and do not exceed, you know, maximum lengths of, of proper wiring. So you follow proper coding and the necessary wire size, gauge size to supply the proper voltage to these units. As we further discuss these, that is there, again, with the oil burners, there's very little issue with those. Um, one other thing I, I miss on the troubleshooting, when you do operate these, if I say you're not getting any flow through the pump, maybe, it's very possible that there is a connecting rod in there that connects the blower to the pump. That may be loose. There's a set screw on it to the shaft. You just, it's a little coupler. You just tighten that up. Another thing I remember on setting up when you operate these, when we talk the air band on the gas burner, there's air band on the oil burner as well. And that's what this is. You can adjust this accordingly. You can see where you can rotate these, open that air, close it. This, the oil burners are opposite the gas burners. You want the minimum amount of air flow with these with no black smoke coming through the stack. The gas burners, you wanted the maximum amount of air. Oil burners, you want the minimum amount of air. And going through that, I, that should cover everything we have on the cremators, whether it be troubleshooting or installing a gas burner or a, a, uh, an oil burner. Now we can go to questions that anyone may have. I have a question. Um, so our electrician set mine up, it is a gas burner and it keeps giving me a low pour signal. Um, me and my boss, Mark Beckman, tested it and it's at 119.8 or 118.9, sorry. And anytime that it's foggy out or real cold, the system will turn on and then it shuts off. Uh, How do we? Pour, that definitely indicates you have a low voltage issue, voltage supply, and you definitely want to verify. You could have a, a, a improperly sized wire going to it. You may have the, the wrong length. You may not have the proper breaker to it. Uh, so if you need to stay, um, you need to stay above. Like I think it's right around 119 or higher. I believe is what you need. It, these since they pull so much power igniting, 
Um, it is a little touchy on that, so you need to make sure you have the proper board supply too. Um, 118 is probably just on that border line, just barely enough to, to, to do it properly. Okay. Um, and then the reset on, I have an afterburner on mine. And the reset on the fan motor is not working. It's very similar to my, like my feed line or fan motors in my barns. Okay. Um, is there a way to test to make sure that the switch itself, because my afterburner has a turn dial switch and then my main burner has the setup that you have there, which is a little bit different actually, because that's an oil one, I believe, right? Yeah. Okay. All afterburners, all afterburner controls will have a mechanical timer, and all the main controls will have electronic control to it. So you have on an afterburner, secondary burner, you have a you have a mechanical timer, and if it's you're having a reset issue on the motor, I you could test the reset. You can do continuity tests on them. If it's failed, there's really not much more to do. You might have to replace the motor itself. Um, and getting back to the mechanical timer itself, as I said, as stated earlier, when you're operating or programming your controller uh, for your amount of time that you need, you must always set your mechanical timer, your afterburner. You must start that operating before you start the main burn. Okay. And maybe it's a pressure issue. You must make sure that that's starting first and before you start the other one. It has to make sure that there's proper airflow, proper pressure coming through. Um, Again, if that if that is working properly, and it's just that reset, you probably just need to replace the motor itself. Uh, what size? Um, my boss just messaged me and asked what the minimum size wire, or what's the size wire we should have for the wiring for the outlet for that. Um, that depends on how far away you are. The proper codes, the electrical codes you have to follow, and everything. Um, anything that's going to carry, you need to carry 20 amps or whatever distance you need to be. Um, chances are, I'm going to say probably 12 gauge, um, probably nothing wider than that. Um, but again, but it depends on how far a distance you're going as well. Um, do not hook it up to an extension cord because you lose, uh, you have a little voltage drop through those. Um, you just need to verify whatever your distance are from your power supply to your cremator. Um, check the proper coding and everything, what's necessary to carry the proper voltage in that distance, what, what gauge wire you may need. Okay, thank you. Yes, you're welcome. I um, have... Go ahead. Uh, sorry, I have a question um, for an individual that asks, what kind of paint do we need to buy for external maintenance? <laughs> There is a, what the manufacturer recommends is a, a farm grade paint, a farm machine grade paint. So something you will put on a you know, piece of implement. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to withstand so many temperatures, you know, a certain temperature of the heat. Most of those will do that. It's just, they put in a farm grade, a farm machine grade. So you go to your implement dealer, your local implement dealer and get a paint from them as well. That I've, I've I've verified with the manufacturer now several times. That's all they state is just a farm grade. They don't. It doesn't matter to them as long as it's a farm machine grade paint. Uh, this is Shannon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Yes. Oh, okay. Can, can I? Okay. Uh, um, I want to ask many questions. Please do not my uh, my question. Okay. Uh, one. Uh, the cremators for livestock, cremator for human, and cremator for garbage. Is it different? Yes, these cremators that we offer are for agricultural uh, animal cremation only. We do not handle anything with any human cremation that is completely different coding. There are completely different types of cremators. Uh, we, we do not deal with that whatsoever these are only for agricultural animal cremation we do have a model that is more for international use that is a hatchery waste uh, cremator 
it is slightly different. We only have one size, one model unit, but it, the difference between it and the standard models is the end plate that the burner mounts to. The burner sets up a little bit higher than the standard models. Also, the inner liner refractory is slightly different material to withstand a different temperature. Uh, beyond that, we do not handle any other type of cremation. Uh, again, it's agricultural animal cremation and no human cremation whatsoever and no other regular garbage. It is just a hatchery waste is the only uh, secondary model that we have. Thank you. I see some supplier, cremated supplier. Actually, uh, they burn garbage, okay? Many company from England, Romania, uh, our competitor, they, you, they, and, but they say that they claim that, that cremators can burn livestock, can burn animals. So is it correct or what is your idea? If that's their models of their, their brand, whichever uh, brand that is, they may design theirs something different than what these are. Again, these are not made for garbage. These are only made for animal cremation or hatchery waste. That is the only thing we offer these for. Yes, I, un I understand. So can I say that uh, uh, this uh, physical, okay, you see the shape of our is oval shape. We don't do square shape. You see all the cremators, they have mostly majority is the square shape, right? What uh, is the I'm difference? I'm understanding what you're saying there. I'm okay, you, you, you looked our cremators, the shape of the uh, our cremator is oval, not square, right? Correct. So, Correct. But many, many cremators, the shape is square. That's many. just a different design. This is a better design because it allows the flow as your, your fire is coming through this way, it comes across the, the media that's inside there and exhaust uh, through the opposite end. This is actually a more, typically is a, is a more efficient design. Uh, we do not offer the square ones or rectangular ones. Again, that is depending on which each manufacturer, how they want to design. Everybody says there may be uh, a, pos a positive option to each type of design. There's always a negative to each type of design as well. We only offer the, the round units. I, I agree with you. Loud one is better than square. Yes. Uh, the natural gas cremator and propane, can we use, uh, can we use uh, same burner or different burner or can we modify propane to uh, natural gas? Uh, you would order a natural gas burner or a propane gas burner. Um, really the only differences inside of it is, I'm sorry, I have it right here is an orifice that's inside this T-block assembly. Oh, that would be I the see. only difference. And you can convert it. I believe we do have a conversion part number for it. Uh, but typically, they are the same burners. Um, it's just that there's just an orifice inside this that would need changed out. Oh, OK, OK. So to modify, to switch uh, to natural gas or propane is very cheap right to it's pretty it's very uh, easy yeah again it's just a little kit that you can purchase to oh, make it oh i see yeah. i see thank you thank you okay you're welcome you're welcome yeah and i ask you if we use the i talk about majority okay uh majority they use the biggest size 2000 pound cremators okay if we load let's say 80 percent or let's say 2000 pound 80 percent of that how many hours become ash? If you load, we 20, divide, only 20%? Yeah. yeah, one time. 80%, let's say 80%, and we burn one time. We, they keep the uh, dead animals, okay, 1,700 pounds. How many uh, hours to get rid of? Seven, 17 hours plus the 30 minutes. Okay. It's, okay. It's, it's, it's one hour per hundred pounds. Yes. Um, if, okay, this is option one. If option two, okay, they put, they continue burning, okay, they put 1,500. 1, After that six hours, 
they load again 300. After five hours, they load another 500 pounds. So this one can burn faster than uh, we burn one time or not. You understand my question? If they, they, they put uh, 2,000 pounds one time, but if someone use same machine, same size, okay, they load uh, 1,200 and in the afternoon, they load uh, another 800. After five hours, they load 400. Okay, which way is better? Uh, it, can be burned. Mean, it is never recommended to load something that has already been burning. Uh, once it's loaded, if you if, if it's hot, it, it gets up to 1400 degrees inside there. And uh, if you, you never, never should be opening the door when these units are running or hot, um, you can cause bodily damage, you can cause harm. Um, you never want to do that. And if you did do that and you loaded some regular, some cooler material inside the unit that is very hot, again, you could cause bodily harm, some damage everywhere. So you never want to do that. Um, if you want to add an additional amount, a smaller load, you just need to wait till everything has, has gone through its full burn cycle, let it cool, and then reload it with the next full cycle. You do you never, never want to load a warm, a hot unit. You never want to recharge a hot unit. Even we stop the cremator and we at loading cannot? Not until it's cooled off. It must be, you want to make sure it's slightly close to cool to the touch, if you want to say, but it must be cool. It can't be, you can't see any glowing you know, a very hot chamber in there because you could cause damage. It could flare up as you have a door, but you could get hurt, you could get bodily harm. Again, you it are must be cool. Yeah, you are correct. There is a fire when we open the the door, you know. There's yeah, that is never recommended. Never do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. But if they use the, you know, in the farm, they use the truck, right? And and they use the long, long stick to push the animal inside no, no never okay. recommend doing that do not ever do that okay next question if we burn pigs swine and chicken okay the smoke amount is the same or different if we burn so yeah it may vary it may change different depending on the fat content because the fat content is different from one animal to another so yes your exhaust smoke may be slightly different Again, that's where you may want to play around with your air adjustment on the different burners. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Uh, another thing, uh, after we set up the time, right? Let's say we, we set the time five hours and we let it running, okay? If I stop, I stop it, I can increase the time half an hour half I can increase but why I cannot decrease if I set up at initial initial setup right I set up at five hours and the machine is running I stop the machine I can it's, increase the time but I cannot decrease the time why I cannot it's it it's programmed into it that it knows that it's already been programmed for a certain time period you're trying to shorten it that believes that you faltered with the load capacity, so it's probably a safety feature. Um, I don't know why you would want to shorten that time period if you already had a program, unless you made a mistake. If you did make a mistake, one thing to do is shut it off, literally unplug it, plug it back in, that will reset the whole control and you should be able to change your time appropriately then. Thank you, sir. Uh, the land chill, okay, in my country, in Thailand, we have the heavy land and very high moisture right and the company sent us the rent to the cover the the burner the the cheap metals okay i think it's uh not enough you know that one you understand can this I, burner put, sorry i do not understand can this burner put outside not with the roof oh yes yeah we never have never typically want a roof over these if if you do install a, a type of cover over these, like a carport cover over these, you must make sure the exhaust that goes through that roof and has to go through two to three foot. And if you're going to go through a type of shelter or covering, 
that has to have proper um, heat, heated duct work around there to protect itself. Uh, again, follow proper codes. But you typically do not want to cover these up because uh, it'll it'll change the exhaust flow and it may not burn very efficiently at all. If you do, if you're in such a high rainy area, like in Thailand, you may have that. If you do put that cover up, again, I don't recommend it because uh, it'll slow it down. But if you have to do it, a minimum of three feet. And typically, if you're going to do that, your your weather's going to get in here anyway. So again, it probably won't help much at all anyway. As it's burning, um, it's going to evaporate that rain coming through anyway. So you should not have an issue with covering these up. You should not have to worry about that. Yeah, uh, Doc. When we bought the machine, right? It come with the 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 cheap plate, the steel plate. They cover the burner. Yeah. Uh, there's a rain shield that would go over. Yeah, rain not, shield. We did yeah, not put the shield. rain shield on this burner for ease of viewing the burner and, every, and, and, and programming for this video. But there is a just a sheet metal guard that covers that that just keeps rain from going on to the control. Um, it's Again, it's just a piece of sheet metal. Yeah, I do feel it's not enough, you know, that one. <laughs> it's it, it, These are made to stay outside. Um, they're sealed, so it should not be an issue. If you feel you have to put a, a cover around it, you can have a local company build one around it, but you have to be able to vent it accordingly. You have to get proper air inside for the motors and everything. So, um, it's again, these are made to be outside. They are designed to be outside. They are sealed and everything, so it should not be an issue. Okay. Sometimes in the farm, they have the wet garbage. Can we burn it with garbage? No. No garbage. No. no. Okay. What about the siling head? Can can we burn the siling head? I'm sorry, I don't know what that. Siling S Y R I N T E, siring 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 head. Can we burn no. it? I, the only thing this these are for. The only thing you operate these units for is animal carcasses or hatchery waste. If you have buy that special model, nothing else can be burned inside these. Okay, what about the, you know, we, the, the gasket door on the loosing? On the, the ash door, the gasket that's on there? Ash, ash on so and the top is on the loosing, you know, and cause the, the smoke leaking. There, you may get different leaking from these units around the door, make slight leakage. You should, it should seal fairly well. These doors are welded and everything to form around this. If it's that I have encountered times where when on the gas burners, when we said that those are set up, that they, they have a higher V2 ready just to make sure that they're purging the gas through. If someone operates that unit at that setting, you may be getting too much heat too quickly in here, and that could warp, that could change the angle of these, and that will cause that to leak more, more air or more smoke. The ash door. There is a gasket material on there. Uh, if there's a deterioration problem, you can replace that. We do have uh, material for that. We have a part of it. We can buy that. Uh, but again, if you're leaking smoke through this door, chances are it may have gotten overheated and it warped the door a little bit. And as we talk about that with the door itself, um, I do want to discuss, and it's we do have insulation kits for these. Depending on what type, what size door you have, what model you have, we have part numbers. We can get a, a full kit where it gives you the stainless steel bands, the insulation itself, or you could buy the parts separately. We do have options where after so much time of use, your refractory may get completely deteriorated after so many years. You can buy new block kits and have them re and you can reline them. And with this, I, I just remembered. When you do operate these units, when you first operate them, the refractory is cured to a point, but when you start operating them, they'll continue to cure a little bit more. You may see cracks in them. That is normal. That is not uncommon. That is a very normal procedure that they are curing. You may generate small cracks. There's nothing wrong with that. They will still hold their shape and do their, their job properly. Doug, I have two more questions um, yeah. before we cut it off and I'm going to leave it open 
that everybody that has any more questions after these last two, if you could email them to me, we will uh, get back to you with an answer. Um, the two questions that I have, the first one is, um, is there any safety lock for the door while it is burning? No, there is not. Okay, and the other question was, can you please have, can you please show or explain how to change the control board as well as how to remove the ignition assembly gun for cleaning? Okay, um, I get the control right here, you're able to see. I'll take the screws off. We only have a couple screws on this control. Um, for ease of service right now, you should have six of them when it's in operation. The control board you see here, you want to disconnect your wire terminals. And there are five nuts that you have to loosen up to remove this board. You put the other one on, slide it on, tighten those nuts up. Be careful not to crack this board. You can, you know, those are, and they're tight. So you wanna make sure you're careful as you're removing and operating this. There's spacers on the backside. Yeah, they're already part of it. They're, okay. yeah, you can see there's spacers back here that set the board appropriately. As since we do have this open, another thing to remember when these units are shipped, you buy, whether you buy 110 volt or 220 volt, there are jumpers right here. If you see on the board, it tells you how to set it up for either voltage. If you need to change it, you can set it accordingly. Right here, we have it set up for 110. I would remove, my fingers are kind of, I'd remove both the jumpers. They're set on separate terminals. To set it for 230, I'd take one jumper and put it on the two middle terminals. Now it's set up for 230 volts. Very simple to do. Um, what was the, oh, the gun assembly. Mm -hmm. I'll keep this control board off. And the gun assembly on the oil burner. You want to open up the transformer door. The gun assembly, there's a fitting right here. You loosen that fitting, take it off. And that sets the, 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 the gun assembly itself. That's your fuel line, your gas line. So once you remove that, you can take that out and you would completely remove the entire gun assembly. You need to be careful because it is inside a tube and it has spacers that locate it accordingly. Um, so it actually may be better actually kind of pull it through the inside of the tank. It'll actually loosen and go all the way inside the tank and pull the gun assembly out. And you can see that you can see the tip of the gun assembly right there. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much, everyone, and have a wonderful day. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir.